Hello, everyone. I'm Pastor John, and welcome to Calvary International Baptist Church to our Wednesday night verse-by-verse and chapter-by-chapter Bible study. Uh, Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for tonight. Even though we're still in pandemic level three and I'm just in the sanctuary with with you and now with the people on online with YouTube. Lord, may you just be with the people who are affected by the COVID-19. I just pray there'll be healing, uh, there'll be comfort. And even the people who are just um, at home, they're wondering when this is going to be over with. Lord, you know. I just pray that your, your peace and your comfort again is with them. So, Lord, we're looking to you. And I just pray that at this time, wherever we may be at, whoever is looking in the, at this Bible study or listening to this Bible study, will you just calm their hearts, calm their minds as we study your word. Bless your people, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. You know, here at Calvary, we study the Bible. We go through the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter on Wednesday nights. And and the hope, the prayer is we can go through the whole Bible. And and tonight we're in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I believe we'll, we'll try to finish chapter 7 too. You know, um the Bible is about life, even though this was written thousands of years ago. It, apply, it applies to them at that time, and it applies to us today. And we know that David, he was just, he's, um, he became the king of both uh, the northern and the southern uh, tribes, and, and he's about to establish the, um, a, a, a tabernacle in um, in Jerusalem, uh, he's uh, planning to bring the the ark back to Jerusalem, and actually he wants Jerusalem to be the spiritual center, the capital of all of Israel, and he knew that you know the Israelis, the, the these Jewish people, they had to have God's help in order to survive. And God led them to where they're at. And, and, and David knew that. And so he wants to just have a, have a place where people can come to, um, Jerusalem for all the, uh, all the sacrifices, all the festivals, uh, for, for the Jew, for the Israelites. And, and he believed this was a good thing. And it was. And bringing the ark back to to Jerusalem is a good thing to do. But you know, he went about it in a wrong way. So you and I will learn today uh, as we as we study this section of the Bible that sometimes our heart is to do right, but we do it in the wrong fashion. So let's um let's get started. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. You remember, um, we're in Second Samuel chapter 6 right now. We just finished up verse uh, 1 and 2. You know the ark was um, was taken by the Philistines um, when you know Eli was priest and their sons were just not doing well and and they they, they took the took the ark of the covenant to the battle and the, the Philistines won and took the the ark to their cities and whatever city they took the ark to God cursed that city where the people had boils. They were sick. And, and, and nobody wanted the ark. These Philistines um, in Ekron, when they, um, they, they saw the ark coming, said, what are you guys doing? Hey, 
you're going to try to destroy us with that ark, the, the, uh, the Israelites' ark? You know, give it back to them. We don't want it here. And so it was, um, uh, God showed his displeasure to the Philistines by taking the ark. And so the Philistines actually, what they did was to, um, to figure out how to take, get the ark back to the, um, to the Jewish, to the Israelites. And they used a cart with oxen and they put the ark in it and they put, you know, a bunch of other, um, uh, things for, for worship, uh, into the ark. And they just let the ark, uh, the, the oxen take, um, take the, um, take the cart with the ark on it. And actually, the oxen took the ark all the way, uh, to Kirith Jerem. And, and the city had the ark. Guess what? They had the ark for around 70 years or so. And in the end, David wanted that ark back to Jerusalem where it belongs. He's going to put a, a tabernacle up, a, a temporary a tent up for, to put the ark in. But again, I said he, he did it in a wrong fashion. Um, you know, the Bible in, in the book of the law talks about how to carry the ark. And it, it basically was in a manner where we, they realized that the ark is holy. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a, um, God gave specific instructions on how to carry it. And only the Levites, the priests can carry it. And it has to have a, a stick right uh, through these, um, rings on the ark. And it tells you, it, it gives you the prescription of carrying it so, for so, for so far, then you have to make a sacrifice. And, and it gives specific instructions. But, you know, nobody at that time looked up what God's word said. They didn't even take the time to do it, and it's going to cost them. All right, verse um, 3. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out to the house of Abinadab, who was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the son of Abinadab. And these are actually the great-grandsons of Abinadab, the, the Hebrew word, because we know it's been 70 years and all that. So it's not just the sons, it's the great-grandsons. Uh, they drove the new cart. And verse 4, and they brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. So Ahio was in front. Verse 5, and then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrum, and on cymbal. You know, it's... um. It's a good thing to um, to to bring the ark back, and and it's but the way, as I said, of doing it, it's we got to be careful how God tells us. If He tells us what to do and we do it in a different way, then that's on us. So what David did in bringing the ark back was to follow what the Philistines did. And these guys are not, they're, they're not people of God. They're, they're, they worship other idols. And, and it's almost like, it's almost like following the world's advice. And there's consequences uh, to that. Um, so let's see what happened. And when they came to Nichon's threshing floor, that's close to Jerusalem, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled, verse 7, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. You know, the law prescribed 
that no one can touch the ark. In fact, when they carry it, they carry it on poles again, and they had specific instructions on what to do after so many steps. And it was covered. No one can actually see, you know, what the ark looks like. And it's, it's, but David did not follow it. So they, these, the oxen and, 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 and the animals and the wheel of the cart, it caught a bump on the road and the ark was going to fall. And, and Uzzah, um, the great grandson of, of, um, Abinadab, he reached out trying to save it. I mean, I mean, anybody would have done that. But because God's law said that no one can touch it, God struck him dead. And this is what happens when we try to, to do something for God, but using the world's way of doing it and not using what God tells us to do. And we do this in today's churches too. You know, a lot of churches, um, and, and sometimes we fall into that, we kind of look around and say, you know, we need to, to do this. Use, um, have meetings this way because that's the way my companies, uh, my company had it and we have success in doing that. Um, we have to, to have, um, big, you know, you know, everything has to be big, big bands, big music, big lights. Uh, and, and we have to do it, have some, you know, these strategic planning. We have to do these marketing in order to attract people. How do we attract people to church? Oh, we have to, you know, you know, have seminars. We have to, to, to reach out to these guys. We have to do things. And, you know, my pastor, um, for many years, you know, Pastor Chuck, he would always say that, you know, it's, it's really, really hard to kind of think of a new ways of attracting people. But why not just do what God says? And in Acts 2.42, um, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it talks about church growth. And it talks about what the early church did. And what did they do? You know, they didn't use these big marketing ideas, these big strategic planning and all these, you know, different goals for everyone and putting a lot of pressure on people. And because, you know, it's almost becoming like big business. You have to attract so many people to keep all these people going. And what did they do in the first century? Acts 2.42, and they continually, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And then it goes on in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You know, God's way for church, in doing church, is not man's way. It's never to kind of, it's never a, a struggle where you have to, you know, think about new things, uh, to do all the time or have these meetings or have these, you know, and, and, and follow these, um, you know, man made, um, you know, ways of, of, um, of coming to a consensus and all that. You know, God's way is, is actually pretty simple. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, teaching God's word, fellowship, having Christian fellowship, breaking of bread, having communion, remembering what God, what Jesus had done for us 2,000 years ago, how he shed his blood for us, how he gave us, how he redeemed us, how we have, um, how our sins were atoned for. It's paid for. He was our substitute, the sinless lamb of God. To remember that, to have breaking of bread. And it's not these big deal, big things going on. And then in prayer, just praying with each other. And, you know, the church actually, you know, a lot of people, they like to be alone. And I have, and with this quarantine thing, um, you know, you know, we have kind of have no choice. 
Uh, but praying together was a big deal. I mean, where two or three are gathered in his name, there I am in their, in their midst. And just by praying and sharing with each other and just, just pouring our hearts out together and praying for specifically for, for, for certain things and, and, and by the way, asking God to do it instead of us going ahead of him is always better, right? So they did these four things. They, they taught, had, they were, learning from God's word, the apostles were teaching, and, and they were having fellowship, they were breaking bread, and they were praying. God's way is always better than, than trying to emulate what the world is doing. And by the way, it's God's job to grow the church. Our job is to listen to him and to plant seeds out, to get the good news out. But to bring people in, to bring people in who are going to be fruitful, who are going to be grounded in his word, that's God's job. Our job is to faithful to God, to love God first, to love others, to be good representatives of him, not to become people like, hey, we're so holy, we go to Calvary, you know, you know we have um, this and that. No, our job is to love others. To, to make sure that pe when people see us, do they see the love of God in each one of us as we love God first and to love other people next? So what David did was really, really, um, is, is, it was not right. Um, he copied what the, the Philistines did and not going back to God's word. So, um, after Uzzah touching the, the ark, and, you know, he died, right? And then David became very angry because the Lord, this is verse 8, the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. You know, David at this time, he really didn't have a really strong sense of, 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 you know, just honoring, you know, the, you know, just knowing that worshiping and, 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 and the Ark of the Covenant and how, how, how God, um, in, in service, in service to God, it's, it's a holy thing. You know, and, and he, he kind of missed out on the, the fear of the Lord. But when he saw that Uzzah died, and that something, I mean, this bad happened. The fear of the Lord came to David. He's thinking that, hey, I'm, I'm not that good either. You know, I don't want to be near this ark. And, and this is what he did. In verse 9, David was fear of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Verse 10, so David would not move the ark ark of the Lord with him to the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Um, this guy was a, um, was a Levite. And verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So David was just looking for some place to park the ark, and he found the closest um, uh, uh, Levite, and, and just left it there. And then he, um, he just left. He was angry. He was, um, you know, I believe the Lord kind of woke him up. I mean, this guy was dancing. He was doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of music. But then this happened, that someone died. And, and it, it kind of, he said, wow. This is serious stuff. To have the Ark of the Covenant come in, you know, it, it just um, it opened up his eyes. And he was not a happy camper. He was afraid. And now this, you know, this, um, the Ark of the Covenant was in Obed-Edom's place, verse 12. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because the Ark of God. So David went and brought up the Ark of the 
earth of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And, it, and so it was, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. That's um, verse 14, so I'll stop there. So God blessed Obed-Edom because the ark was there. And then people start telling David, say, you know, you know, God's blessing Obed-Edom and, you know, we should bring it back here. Maybe God will bless us and all that. And, and, and David did. But David, this time, instead of doing it the wrong way, he did it the right way. Why? In First Chronicles um, chapter 15, he has the same story here. And actually, it tells us in more detail that David had his priests go search the laws of how to do this, how to carry the ark. You know, he should have done this the first time. But he, he learned from his mistake. And for you and me, you know, there's going to be consequences of doing things wrong. But we should learn from our mistakes. We should go back and especially go back to the Bible and, and ask the Lord, you know, how, how do you want to do this? And David did that. In fact, every, he says every six paces, they, sacrifice, they made a sacrifice. And six paces is around 30 feet. So you think about it, bringing the ark back now is carried by the priest. Nobody's touching the ark. And, and then every six paces, 30, around 30 feet or so, they're making sacrifices. So it's a slow march. And David, um, he, um, he took out his, his uh, royal clothes. And then he was, he's going to be dancing now. And I think it's, um, it's a good thing that David decided that he needs to go back to the, to the law and figure out exactly how to do it. So my encouragement is we go back to the Bible when we don't understand and ask the Lord, how does he want us to do, do things in life? Verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of trumpet. Now the ark of the Lord came to the city of David and Michelle, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised her, despised him in her heart. So this was what was happening. David took off his, you know, all his royal stuff, and then he just danced. He was dancing, and he was twirling. And he says, whirling here. And he was just dancing with all his heart, and I believe David uh, wanted to, um, he was just so excited, so happy that the Ark of the Covenant is coming back, is going to be in Jerusalem. And, and, and he was just, um, he was dancing with all his heart with, a, you know, a abandonment. He didn't care. And by, by taking off all the royal clothes and just by wearing, wearing just common clothes, he was saying that, you know, I may be king and all you guys are, are servants, but in front of God, I'm just like you. I am just in front of God who is holy, who is a creator of heaven and earth, who created each one of us. I'm just like one of you. We're all in it together. And David was just jumping up and down, twirling, whirling, and, 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 and having a blast. So, but while he was having a blast, and by the way, he was having so much fun, and this was actually so deeply ingrained in him that he wrote two psalms, um, one psalm, but it's in two separate places. Uh, one, um, if you, you know, you can take the, take, take this down. It's Psalm 105 verses 1 through 15 is the first part of what was happening here. And then, you know, he, David was writing his psalm and just praising God and, and, and just singing and dancing and just being very, very, um, deeply 
happy, having joy. And the second part of it is in Psalm 96, because all the Psalms were just all, when they broke it down, they just took everything together and they, they, they made songs out of it. And so Psalm 105, 1 to 15, and Psalm 96 um, is the second part of that Psalm, and it's at this sec for this section. And you can ask me, so how do you know that? Well, the Bible explains the Bible. And if you go to um, First Chronicles 16, it'll tell you exactly what happened. And then th that's the place where David got this, um, th those two psalms. It's one song broken in two different places. This is a time where David was deeply joyful. He was just really s psyched up, and he was just very happy. But because of that, um, there's trouble at home because his wife, the daughter of Saul, Michelle, was looking out and saw her husband, the king, dancing like a wild guy in commoner's clothes, taking off, he took off all his, um, taking off all, all his royalties and just, just dancing and acting like a, a, um, a crazy guy. A madman. So she despised him in his in her heart. And you know, when you when someone has that, that in their heart they just man, they just don't like you anymore. Um that's the beginning of trouble right there. Verse seventeen. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle where David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, then distributing among all the people, among the, all, the whole multitude of Israel, both women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed everyone to his house. So everyone was coming. I mean, the house, everyone from Israel, they came and they were partying and, and David was just so happy and David gave everyone a gift. It's um, a loaf of bread, a piece of, of meat, you know, and then uh, a cake of raisins. And uh, everyone loves presents and they get, you know, they get to see the art coming back, the Lord's with them, and then, and they get, a, they get to take home gifts. So everyone was kind of on a high. And David, of course, was probably on the mountaintop. He was just, you know, just so psyched, so excited, so thankful that, that God, that the Ark of the Covenant, um, it basically, is representing that God, God, God's there, and 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 um, the 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 judgment seat is there, and God's presence there, and He put the ark into the tabernacle that He erected the tent for the tabernacle, so everything was good, and nothing. I believe there was, David was probably thinking, you know, nothing's going to bother him now. <sighs> You know, whenever we're at the mountaintop experience and whenever we're so close to the Lord, um, you know, who doesn't like that? Satan doesn't like that. And, and every time, you know, you go to a retreat or you're doing so well with the Lord, you know, Satan doesn't like it. And he's going he's gonna to do everything he can to pull you down and just gut punch you. So this is what happened. Verse 20, then David returned to bless his household. David was so happy. He wants to bless his household. He wants to bless his children, his wife, and all that. But his wife came out. And Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, Hmm. As one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Oh, David. I mean, 
you're, you're, you're the king, and, and you're taking off your clothes in front of all the girls there, all the servant girls there, and just like a commoner, you think you're so cute, you know, and, 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 and who do you think you are, and, and you're, you're dancing like a crazy guy in front of commoners, <sighs> you know? David, as I said earlier, he, he had the right idea. He believed that in front of God, all of us are the same. There, there's no these class systems and, and all that stuff. In front of God, we're all sinners. In front of God, we without Jesus, we have no hope. In front of God, we need to bow down before him, and we need to, to worship him. It's not about what other people see and all, all that stuff. In fact, I'll be talking about this this coming Sunday. So Michelle, David's wife, got, I mean, you know, he, she was just pounding David. David came in to bless his family, but this is what he what he um. Uh, what he meant. And the thing about this is that when we, when we're not happy, sometimes our mouth just, um, you know, just goes way too fast. And every time we have words that come out of our mouth, our mouth is almost like, it's, it's, um, it's like a sword. It's like a sharp-edged sword. And, and, and we decided to take our sword out and start, start hurting people with it. And it leaves, leaves consequences. It leaves damage. And when someone like Michelle takes his, take her sword out and start yelling and, and just getting into David's face, oh, you're, you think you're so cute. You're uncovering yourself and in front of other people and, you know, don't you feel ashamed and all that? Started cutting him. And guess what? When someone starts to hurt you like that, our initial reaction is to bring out our own sword, the sword of our tongue, and to hurt the other person too. And this is where, you know, we, you and I, and especially me, I'm learning that not to do that because in this world, we're going to get a lot of people who wants to hurt us with their mouth. And, and they'll, they'll say certain things. And it's always, I mean, the first reaction is always like, I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to get them back. You know, uh, almost what? I'm almost 60. Unless, well, my next birthday, I'll be 60. So live life. Uh, live some life. Uh, not, you know, may not be as long as some of you, but... Uh, six decades is, is its life here on earth. I've learned recently, just recently, not to, to, to take that sword out that quickly, if at all. And the reason is that, you know, there are just bad consequences that come out. And some, and right now I'm learning to just, you know, go back to the Lord and just, Lord, you know, this is what happened. You saw it. And this was in my heart, and you know my heart. Lord, uh, will you just deal with this? You know, I'm just going to give it to you. You tell me to love people and to, to love you first, to love others. Okay, that's what Jesus commanded us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, help me to do that, and help me not to take out the sword and start hurting people with it. And this goes especially for family members. I mean, so easy to take that sword out and start start just, you know, poking holes and slashing. And it leaves marks, and, and it leaves marks for a long time, sometimes a lifetime. And David, at this time, decided to take his sword out. So, verse 20, then David returned to bless his uh, household, but Michelle, you know, and Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said all that stuff. Verse 21, so David said to Michelle, it was before the Lord 
who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. For as a maid servants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Wow. David went for the throat. He said, hey, I wasn't dancing for, for people. I was dancing before the Lord. And God chose me over your own dad, over daddy, to be ruler over Israel, over his people. And the people you say that, that, that are um, commoners and the mains, seeing, seeing me undignified, oh, I'm going to even do more than that because they held me in honor. I mean, he just took out his sword and just boom. And then it's sad. Verse 23. Therefore, Michelle, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. You know, it's a, um, it's a, it's sad when we decide to do all this stuff. She, you know, if she could have, she should have, um, not said anything. She should have said, you know, maybe I didn't understand why you're doing it, honey, and, and let's talk about it and, and, and do it in a, you know, in a way where it's edifying, where you can have a conversation. And sometimes you and I lo love to just jump and just boom and pound. And, and you know, I used to. I used to say that, you know, I don't know how God uses me because I used to just want like to pound people down. And it's, um, it's not right. And back then, you know, for a woman not to have children, it was a great shame for, for the woman. And she, so from the text, David never been with her from that day on again. And she had no children. It's a sad story. Let's, then let's go to verse seven, um, chapter 7. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. You know, David was, was in his palace. He built his palace in Jerusalem, and he's looking out, and he saw the tabernacle. It was under a tent, and the Ark of the Covenant was there, and he's thinking that, you know, I'm living in a nice place, and the Ark is in a tent. That doesn't make sense. I'm going to build a place for, to, for, for the Lord. I'm going to honor the Lord by building a nice temple, by building a, a big temple, and, 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 and he told Nathan about it. And Nathan, you know, this guy, he, um, he's a prophet, nice guy, but sometimes, you know, he can speak faster than, than he should because he never consulted the Lord with this. And he said, oh, that sounds good. Go do it. But what happened? Verse 4. And But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. 7. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribe of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Verse 8. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Verse 9. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, been with you wherever you have gone, past tense, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have 
have present tense made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth verse 10 moreover i will appoint a place for my people israel and will plant them and they have dwelt in a place of their own and moved no more nor shall the son of the wickedness oppress them any more as pre previously since the time that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel and have caused them to rest from all the enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. And then verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and your rest with your father, I will set up your seed. This is future. So we had past, present, and then future. I will set up for your seed after you and you will come uh, you will come from your body and i will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my, for my name and i will establish his throne of the kingdom forever verse 14 i will be his father and he shall be my son and if he commits iniquity i will chasten him with a rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men but my mercy shall not depart from him as i took it from saul whom I remove from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. And then I'm going to stop there at verse 16. Wow. So David told Nathan that he what he was going to do. Nathan said, go for it. But God said, told Nathan, said, hey, whoa, slow down here. You know, David he's a, a man of war and and he's not going to be a man who's going to be building my temple and and not just that uh but he's going to build for me a house but tell go tell him that i'm going to build for him an eternal house a house that'll last forever and then you know and yeah, this Nathan, he, I believe he learned a lesson too. He needs to, to, you know, think about this. He went to talk to, he was talking to the king and said, go for it, go for it. And now he's going to have to go back and tell him, no, no, no. Um, it's not going to be you. It's going to be, it's going to be, um, uh, your son. And then not only that, God's going to build you an eternal, a eternal ho uh, house. And I always think that for, for me and for you, possibly, you know, we need to spend more time with God. And any decisions that someone makes or someone requests, you know, it's always good to say that, hey, I need to pray about this first. Let me check with the Lord. And let me ask for the Lord to, to give me peace. And, and you go pray, too. But don't just go and say, oh, we're just going to do this without even thinking because now you have to go back. And then verse um, 12, uh, uh, verse, oh, no, verse 17, um, according to all these words um, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. But, you know, there's a, um, there's a section here that I want us to look at. This is very interesting, and this is how God deals with His people. He told that He told uh, Nathan told David that God said that from your body, from your seed, He'll establish His kingdom. In verse twelve, then verse thirteen, He said He'll build a house for My name, and I'll establish the throne of His kingdom forever. But then in verse fourteen, He said, "I will be His father, and I will chasten Him with a rod of men and with blows." of the sons of man, but my mercy will not depart from him. You know, this is interesting. God chastens his children. God chastens his people. And he will correct his people um, for the reason of remedy. To, to remedy something, meaning that if you're his children, God will chasten you. God will correct you. But if you're not his children, throughout the Bible, God punishes you for your sins. 
that God chastens his people to remedy, to make, to make a correction, to, to get you back into doing the things that he wants you to do or he wants me to do. And the truth is, if, if God is chastening me or you, and many times God had to chasten me, and it's not pleasant. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes it, it's painful and it's just, yeah, it's, it, it feels very hard. But we should rejoice. What? We should rejoice. Because if God chastens us, that just confirms that we're his children, that he loves us so much that he's willing to, to correct us, to bring us back to him. And there's a um, Proverbs. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Proverbs 3, uh, I believe it's 11 here. Uh, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his corrections. And verse 12, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. You know, God chastens us. And if you're under God's chastening today, get back with him. Repent and get back with him. And you can rejoice in the fact that, that you're his children. So you're, you're his child, one of his children. And um, I know it's not pleasant, but God chastens. But if you're not his chosen, uh, children, then God will punish. He punishes sin. And then verse 18, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? You know, David knew what, God, what Nathan was saying to him. When Nathan said, God's going to establish his kingdom forever, that to him, and he interprets it correctly as we go through the Bible, that the Messiah, that the future Messiah, the hope of Israel, is going to come through his lineage. And Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, did come through the lineage of David. And David understood what that meant. And he's going, Lord, who am I? I'm just a lowly guy. Who am I? Why are you so good to me? He says, who am I? And what is the house that you have brought me this far? And because God reminded him that he brought him from the sheepfold. David was just a shepherd. And God reminded him that he, was, he brought him from the sheepfold to ruler over Israel, to be king. And David is just so in awe. And, and David's heart was to do right. He did it the wrong way in the beginning, but now he got it right because he went back to God's law. But now God's saying that you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to let your son do it, but I'm going to build you an eternal house, a house that's going to last forever. The Messiah is going to come through your lineage. What an amazing thing. And David was just blown away. Who am I? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And this, and yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house of a great while to come. Is this a matter of man, O God? And he's saying that, you know, this was a small thing in your sight, but, you know, this is huge. And only, you know, man can't do this. This is only the grace of God can do this. This uh, Is this a matter of, matter of man, O oh Lord God? Man can't do this. You know, David was just shocked, in awe, pra praising God. He was just an, a, a, a shepherd boy. And God gave him so much. God made him king. And God defeated enemies for him and he had all these things going on and now he's got the ark back and now 
instead of him building God a house, God's going to build him an eternal house. And he says, who am I? And, and he was very, very humble. And, you know, God chooses, and this gives me a lot of hope, because God chooses people who we wouldn't expect to be, to do his job. God chose, you know, the fishermen, you know, Peter, James, John. God chose tax collectors. God forgave um, the, the girl who was, who was caught in adultery. Go, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. God uses very unlikely people for his glory because we don't show, you know, normally you and I don't show that much grace to people. We, we, we would think that, you know, we're just going to give things to people who deserve it, who we think deserve it, and who have high status and all of that. But Jesus, our Lord Jesus, he doesn't see things that way. I mean, he spends most of his time with, with what we call sinners. And I'm thankful for that because I'm a sinner. He spent time with me and he picked me up from the dirt from the bottom and he allows me to to serve him and what a wonderful thing I mean the truth is there's, I've been through a lot in my life but there's nothing I'd rather do than to, to share the gospel to share the, the word of God with others and God uses people broken people for his purposes so for you and me, do we see ourselves before God as, Lord, I'm deserving. Uh, hey, I, that church, my family built it. You know, you know, without my family, Calvary wouldn't exist. Uh, I mean, you know, we need to be broken before holy God. And David had it right. He took out his royal robe. And he um he took out the ephod and he just um he danced he had joy just like everybody else and he said who am I and I asked the same thing and we should ask the same thing who am I that you would come and die for my sin the sinless Lamb of God taking my place who am I who are we and then David. Kept, he prayed. He Verse 21, For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things. God's done all these great things to make your servant know them so that we can know God. For, uh, for, to make your servant know them. Therefore, verse 22, Therefore, you are great not i am great you are great O lord god for there is none like you nor is there any god beside you according to all we have heard with our ears so you know it's not the mormons where they believe they're going to be god and have their own planets later um or any of the other religions where you're going to become a deity there's only one God, and the Word of God says it. You are great, O Lord, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you. There's only one God. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. One way to God, and it's through the Son, Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 23, And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem, redeem from Egypt, for himself as a people to make for himself a name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land, your, before your people whom you redeem for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods, you know, the, this 
God redeemed uh, the Israelites from Egypt. And only he can redeem. And Egypt was a type of the world. And the Lord did the same thing for us too. He redeemed us from the world by the death of Jesus. He paid the price that we should have paid. And we couldn't pay. But God paid it for us. He brought us back, bought us back with his life. And he says that, um, verse, uh, where are we? Verse 23 again. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for himself a name and to do for yourself a great and awesome deed? Uh, for your land, before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nation and their gods. Verse 24, and for you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. You know, Israel is always going to be, um, is always going to be God's people. It says so right here. Your very own people, and, and I know there are groups of people and a lot of seminaries, including um, some of the professors in my own seminary, that, um, that believe that the church replaced Israel. Israel blew it, and, and you know, this is for another discussion, um, not for this Bible study. But I'm going to go with God's word as is, because it, it's... Um, it's not really good exegesis to explain how the church can replace Israel. That means if the church replaces Israel, you get all the blessings, but you also get all the curses. And that's how the church has to be in the middle of the tribulation and all that. And it's just not good exegesis. It's, um, anyway, that's, um, for another, another, another section, uh, when we get to, um, Revelation and, um, and, and different parts of the Bible. But with that said, Israel will always be Israel, and, and they're God's chosen people, but that doesn't mean God did not um, come for his church. In fact, God's going to come for his church, and we have a role to play. And Israel, right now, they're not saved yet. But one day, one day the Bible tells us even... Uh, even in the Old Testament, of course, in Revelation, that they will recognize the one that they pierced. And they finally realize that it's the Messiah, that Jesus was the one they pierced. And so a lot of things that we can go over later on. But Israel will be Israel. They're gonna be, there's going to be a remnant left of, um, of Israel. And, and God's going to deal with them. God's going to save uh, part of them, um, but many, many people from from the, the the Jewish nation will come to know the Lord, and I believe from the Word of God, it's going to be in in in, in the, during the tribulation. But that's um that's for another discussion. And then uh, verse twenty five. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever, as you do, as you have said. Verse 26, so let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord uh, of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I have built you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. So David gave this beautiful prayer, and he's actually saying that, You know, Lord, do your thing. Let your word be true. You know, I was going to do this, but I want to follow you. My son's going to take care of the, the temple, and then you're going to establish the Messiah in the lineage. Go do your thing. And then verse 28, And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant. And let and, the, and it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Do what you want to do, Lord. And, you know, for you and me, we should say the same thing. You know, we want to follow God's plan. 
we want to follow God's purpose. We never want to go before him. And the way to do that is to walk with him daily and to just pray and not, you know, and just follow the prescribed actions, not using the world's views and not the pressures from the world, not using um, man-made, you know, thinking. But the word of God, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Um, that's God's plan. And God's the one who adds to his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for uh, tonight's um, Bible study and to the study of your word. I just pray, Lord, that you help us. Help us to just go to you. Help us to just uh, keep you uh, in the conscience of our hearts, our minds daily. And, and if we ever get stuck in what to do in life, to just go to you, Lord, to go to your word and to ask you, what would you like me to do? And how would you like me to do this? And Lord, I just pray for the people right now. I know there are people tonight who are, who are listening to this. You know, they're, they're lost. They're, they want to serve. They want to do what's right, but they're doing it the wrong way. They, they, they don't know how to do the right way. Lord, will you show them? Will you just uh, let them know, give them the wisdom? And I pray for those of you who want to do the right way, God's way. Well, uh, you know, you, you, sh you, you should just pray. I would encourage you to just ask the Lord with an open heart and ask him to lead you in that right way. So, Lord, be with your people tonight. Bless each one. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining me, and um, we'll see you here uh, next Wednesday, God willing. God bless you.